Good morning and welcome to our session on broadening sustainability and moving it into the mainstream. Now, the rise in consciousness of sustainability in financial markets in the past two years has been extraordinary. It now seems that the economy and governments are at last doing what environmentalists have been calling for since the 1980s, transforming the whole economy to a low carbon model. But do we actually know what we're doing? Are we going to get it right? What's the role of capital markets in all this? Are they just passengers or an active and influential participant? And if environmentalism has won the day, what about social justice? Has there been a secular shift towards a fairer society? Here with me to discuss these issues, we have an excellent panel of six experts. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves now. Um, so uh, Molly, would you like to go first? Thank you, John. Hello, everybody. So my name is Molly Scott Cato, and until Brexit happened, I was a member of the European Parliament uh, representing the Green Party, and I was on the Economics and Monetary Policy Committee. So I, I started the process of sustainable finance in the Parliament by um, being a rapporteur on a, on a report, and then I moved on to work on a couple of pieces of law, uh, one on benchmarking and one on mandatory disclosure. And I now, unfortunately, I have no power at all. I've gone back to the university where I'm a professor of economics at Roehampton. Thank you, Molly. Heike? Hi, my name is Heike Reichelt, and I'm uh, from the World Bank Treasury. I head the Investor Relations and Sustainable Finance team, and we're responsible for the issuance of uh, World Bank bonds and bonds issued by the International Development Association. And it's great to be here today. Thank you. Ronald? Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ronald Van Loon. I am a portfolio manager at BlackRock. I specialize particularly in European fixed income, but also particularly in ESG. I'm also the co-manager of the ESG Euro Bond Fund. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, good morning. I'm Sarah Wilson. I'm the head of ESG integration at Nuveen, the asset manager for TIAA. And you know, I'm responsible for integrating ESG factors into our investment process and um, designing ESG products for our clients. Thank you. And Chuka? Hi, I'm Chuka Mena. I'm a Managing Director and Head of the ESG Advisory Practice in the Corporate and Investment Bank of JP Morgan Chase. Um, I also oversee our ESG performance and, and, and profile uh, across EMEA. Um, and before joining the bank, um, I used to head the ESG consulting practice of Edelman, the strategy and communications firm. I had a number of non-executive director positions on UK boards where I was a lead on ESG issues. And, and before that, I was a member of the UK Parliament for a decade. And for half that time, I was the shadow secretary of state for business innovation and skills and, and, and led on business, the economy, and what we now call ESG um, we didn't always call it that back then, but good to be joining you this morning. Thank you. It's a convenient shorthand. Um, now, uh, Fritz, how about you? Hi, thank you, John. I'm uh, Fritz Lutlin. I run Debt Capital Markets and Syndication here at DZ, and uh, it's my privilege to be on the panel with you. Thanks. Thank you. So um, we're going to begin by talking about this rise of awareness of ESG, uh, for want of a better abbreviation, in financial markets, which, which has clearly been remarkable. But is this just about communications and people wanting to look good? Um, or is it actually valuable? Um, Molly, uh, perhaps you could start with that. Well, I suppose I started out as a skeptic here um, and definitely a critic of financial markets. But my time in the European Parliament, I found that actually there was a way in which encouraging finance, especially to report what it was doing clearly, could enable investments to move in a sustainable direction. And so, um, yeah, so I, I have to say I agree with you, John. It's astonishing the, the pace with which this has changed. And I felt that that was partly because politicians were giving a clear signal that they were committed to this agenda. I would say that the, the fastest progress by far is in the area of climate. Um, so we have countries pledging that they will reach net zero by a certain time and companies and, you know, the farming sector and everybody's now saying when they'll get to net zero. And that is quite an astonishing change for somebody like me who's a green. It's probably only a decade since I imagined our life without fossil fuels. And now all companies getting on board for that and countries establishing dates for that. And so 
I find that really encouraging and that does then set a framework for investments. But I would say, well, we've made that progress on climate. That's only part of the E and um, a lot of the E is also about the ecological crisis and the loss of biodiversity and habitats. And there's much less focus on that and much less success in that area. And also we shouldn't forget that we can sometimes have conflict between these different agendas. So, you know, um, we, we may say, oh, well, let's go and plant trees in Gabon or something, but perhaps that will then reduce the biodiversity in that country and reduce the ability for people there to, to have subsistence livelihoods from their own land. So global equality um, issues, which fall under the S, uh, governance issues as well, and climate and environmental issues are sometimes in conflict. So I would say we've really made progress on climate, but people are only beginning to understand the way these different agendas interact. And that's where we need to see um, both politicians and financiers moving now. Thank you. Um, so, Sarah, um, I'm sure you don't feel it's it's all talk, but um, how do you make the case that it's valuable? You're right that I don't feel it's all talk. Um, I would say that at Nuveen, we've we've been focused on this area for over 50 years. Um, you know, we, we don't think it's all talk because we have a track record of engaging with companies to help uh, change the way that they operate and, and improve their impact on communities and on the environment. Um, we we have evidence to show that you know we are among the top holders of, of green social and sustainability bonds in the world and we pair that with uh, reporting around the positive impact that those achieve in the real world and you know we've been on the journey to integrating esg factors into every investment decision that we make um, so all 1.2 trillion dollars of our assets are now considering uh, financially material esg factors and you know we we aim to raise the bar on on how and how and uh, to what level we do that all the time. Uh, an example is that you know we mentioned net zero. We we're now the largest U.S. based insurance company committed to net zero, and we have a significant percentage of our assets that are have a concrete target aligned with them. So you know we think that those are proof points, and we think that it shows that it's possible for. Uh, the financial sector to to actually have an impact on on these environmental and social issues. Thanks very much. Now, Ronald, um, BlackRock, obviously the biggest investment firm in the world. You get a lot of praise as being ahead on the curve for sustainability, but also criticism from the avant-garde NGOs and so on. So how do you make sure that uh, BlackRock is you know, having an impact? Yes, thank you. Yeah, certainly. When I when I look at the last 10, 15 years or so, it's certainly been a huge, a huge journey, not just for BlackRock, but uh, also for for the clients that we serve. Right, we serve a very broad array of clients, and they are at a variety of of, of scales on the spectrum of of ESG, from from, you know, from right from beginners to to very well advanced. Uh, I must say though that on a personal basis, if I look back, um, for for example, this year there is not a single investment committee meeting or research meeting that uh, that we've had this year that does not involve ESG. Um, you take it actually one step further and look at you know from a portfolio management point of view, look at the bond market valuations, and look at uh, you know tobacco bonds, uh, look at uh, some of the valuations of the oil majors, look at some of the auto manufacturers early on in the year. It is it is virtually impossible to ignore it. So it's just a degree to which you incorporate it, which is uh, which is important. Uh, the, the the name of the panel, broadening sustainability, and I'm I'm very positive. This has been huge, certainly been a huge uh, huge uh, move over the last few years, and I expect this for it to continue. Thanks very much, Heike. How about from your seat at the World Bank, which has been clearly centrally involved for a long time? Yeah, thank you. We've seen um, massive change, and some of it has already been mentioned. Um, so we're seeing, you know, investor behavior changing, and it's not just uh, Nuveen and BlackRock, um, who, as they say, have been um, uh, doing this for, for over a decade or, or longer. It's really all investors. So there's no investor meeting that we have that doesn't cover this topic. And it's not just sort of an add on at the end. Oh, let's talk about ESG it comes up really early in the conversation. Um, and, you know, from the World Bank perspective, and we may not have been calling it ESG, but uh, um, the World Bank's purpose um, is to finance um, sustainable development and focus on the um, social KPIs of each project, social or environmental. 
So this is just something that, that we finance, but it's something that um, investors are just increasingly aware of. So investor behavior has been changing, issuer behavior has been changing, where issuers communicate and report transparently on. So it's really not just about communication, it's about actual reporting. Um, and the reporting flows into financial models. So either assessing um, uh, the risks and they're still underpriced in, in financial models because externalities are not priced in, but um, that's changing with the transparency, regulation. Um, so I, I think um, it's really a, it's a journey as Sarah said, but uh, there's, there's no going back. It's um, I would say that the train we're on is going faster and faster in a good way. Okay, thank you. Not so, the um, edge of a cliff, then we hope. No, no, no. <laughs> it, um, well, un unless you don't get on board, right? So, yeah. Um, I think I think the question of pace is very important, actually, and 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 relevant to this question. So, Fritz, you know, do you think, um, you know, is DZ Bank going fast enough? You're on mute, Fritz. I think. There you go. Uh, I think uh, the um, in ter terms of our own institution, uh, we're a cooperative institution. The first ever cooperative uh, was built f was uh, was founded for sustainably managing a forest. Uh, the cooperatives are there to treat externalities and to avoid the tragedy of the commons. That's that's really at the centre of of what they are. So um, so we feel in a kind of a good starting point from about 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, but uh, no, what are the actual developments uh, are characterized by um, a strong focus on the loan book to, um, to measure ESG risk that is entailed there. Um, so uh, the ECB is an important driver as a supervisory institution to that, not just to us, but to all of the banks. Um, that uh, pays into also some exclusion criteria about certain industries that we're not financing any more through the loan books um, as an institution or as, a, as an industry. Uh, and, that, uh, and that comes with internal discussions and it comes with uh, a lot of consideration. Uh, so, um, uh, so yes, we are doing a lot, not just as one institution, but as an industry. Um, and, uh, and also in the, in the context of capital markets, I think talk is good. It's not just talk, right? So talk is the defining element of getting the plumbing right for the next stage of getting to um, really getting to net zero and that's to transform the manufacturing industries on the asset side. Uh, and, um, and I think that's, that's also something that we as a financial markets franchise want to facilitate. Thank you. So Chuka, um, you've come into the banking world from uh, obviously ultimately the political sphere and uh, you know, from from the sort of world of ESG, w what do you think about the the value of of what's going on in the banking and capital markets world? I think it's enormous, and I think it's extraordinary the change that we have seen in mindset relative to where we were five to ten years ago. Not just on the environment, but on the whole gamut of ESG issues and the intersection between what a company does and its impact on society and financial materiality um but let's just let, let's just be frank money talks right and there's two aspects to this um uh, one is the fear of stranded assets uh in the event that we have the catastrophic climate change which we are forecast to have if we don't change the way that we live and two is the impact of a new generation of investors who have materially changed the nature of the conversations that asset managers are having with asset owners. Uh, and, you know, there is a view in Brussels, in Westminster, in Washington, I've said this many times before, that somehow you get change and markets and businesses react by bashing them with a big stick or there's some, you know, extremely inspiring messianic type leader who gets us all to change the way that we live. Uh, but I think that underplays the demand and the impact of this new generation of investors who so often get maligned and chucked up into the bracket of kind of irresponsible, speculative investors getting involved in GameStop and on Reddit. But the truth of the matter is, it is that cohort, that new generation 
who are saying within often very wealthy families, look, um, I'm very happy mum and dad for our family savings to be invested in things that deliver values, but I want those things to adhere to my values too. And that ultimately is what moved this whole thing long before the pandemic happened. And of course, you see politicians who are keen to get their votes also responding to that too. Um, and if I'm wrong on that, well, I'll hold up exhibit A, which is the fact that in US, we have seen ESG emerge as a really important factor. We have seen also record inflows into the ESG and sustainable funds stateside over the last three to four years. And that's in spite of the fact for the majority of that period, you have had perhaps the most anti-ESG administration under President Trump that you could imagine. And so I think, you know, we can all pat ourselves on the back and, and policymakers too. But I, I don't think we can underestimate the impact of this inter intergenerational transfer of wealth from baby boomers um, to millennials and, and younger cohorts. And, and the, the, the long and the short of it is, is whatever your sector, whether you're uh, one, you know, come from one of the uh, constituent parts of the financial services sector or you're in another industry, if you ignore that, it's, you, you're going to lose business, it's going to affect the bottom line and your equity story in the long run and um so you know i'd love to say that it was because everybody has you know suddenly um believed that we need to move towards more of a stakeholder capitalism form of organizing our economy some might want something more radical but but i think ultimately the commercial imperative is probably what has moved this more than anything else more recently um and that's before considering the impact of of, of covid19 bringing the s into view um much more than before um, well, that's very encouraging, I think, and um, uh, it makes it feel organic. And it also is a justification for, for talking, which, which after all is what we're doing. Um, so I, I, I want to I, I talk about climate change, right, which is clearly the central issue in sustainability, because if we don't get that right, this is, there's not going to be much left. Now, we've seen um, net zero commitments uh, sprouting across the financial sector and, and alliances indeed uh, in, in every sort of stream of the capital markets um, being formed to, to support those pledges. But I want to ask, are, are, those, are they being ambitious enough? Because um, after all, you can say net zero in 2015, it's a good 30 years away. What really matters is what happens quite soon. So it, and, and banks, of course, are saying, oh, we have to still support our clients, even if they're in dirty industries. And asset managers say, well, we have to take direction from asset owners. So uh, uh, perhaps, uh, Molly, you'd like to go first on that. Do you think do you think these net zero pledges are credible and ambitious enough? Well, from a political point of view, absolutely not. And what politicians are doing is posturing and um, setting targets for other people to meet. You know, if you set a target 20 years ahead, you can pretty much guarantee you won't be in power then having to match that. So on this question, as far as politicians go, I'm with Greta Thunberg, I have to say, where's the plan? I want action this year or rather 20 years ago. But um, I mean, I think it's a little bit different from the finance sector because the finance sector has its own objectives and it works within a political framework. And um, I think there's quite a few different issues we need to unpick here, because when we say net zero, we're effectively saying we'll still be using fossil fuels, but we'll have to offset the carbon dioxide emissions from some of those fossil fuels. So the first question is really how how and how much fossil fuels will we still be using even in 10 years time? And what will we be using them for? And personally, I would like to see a carbon tax so high that, you know, you, coal would only be useful for jewellery and oil would only be <laughs> useful for making plastic for medical uses, you know, so basically driving fossil fuels. Uh, very quickly. I mean, I, I admit there'll be some residual use, but a lot of the, when people say net zero, a lot of what they're talking about in terms of the net is technologies that don't really exist uh. yet or at scale. Uh. Obviously, you can have natural carbon sinks, but, you know, if you're talking about carbon capture and storage, then it just um, hasn't hasn't really been made to work in, in a cost effective way. But I think to, to come back to your point about are people wrong to carry on investing in the dirty industries, I think that's fairly easy to, to work through in a sort of triaging sense, because fossil fuels, no, I think just get out of those as fast as possible. There'll be some chicken games down the end of the line where, you know, maybe Australia and a few companies decide they're going to hang on to those assets for people that still use them. But but essentially, we are moving out of fossil fuels. And that is a snowball that's rolling faster and faster, possibly towards the edge of the cliff. 
but um yeah so there's that and then there's there's industries which will be part of a sustainable future but which are going to have to rapidly transition and reduce their co2 and other environmental impacts so something like cement or steel you know we have to find different we have to find alternatives to cement that don't produce masses of co2 we have to find a way of producing green steel um, so, you know, that's about the transition and finance can play a really important role there. And that's what we tried to do with our benchmarking legislation, which had a, a carbon transition benchmark in there, which said, you know, you need to make this transition mm. against scientifically agreed targets and rapidly. And then we have the industries, of course, where we should be encouraging investment, which is what the EU taxonomy tries to do, which are the industries that are already part of the green future, renewable energy, you know, um, carbon sink type industries, organic farming and so on. So, um, yeah, I think I, I agree with what Chucker said very much about people's motivations changing, but I think we also need to see the legal framework changing and that, that's what the EU is trying to do. And I think investors are responding to that. And I think that that lever will sort of carry on being used and that is helping. It's helping investors because it gives them a clear sense of the trajectory and clear signaling so they know where the stranded assets are going to be that they need to avoid and where they can invest for the long term and be sure of a return. OK, thank you. So, um, uh, Sarah, um, you're part of the asset management industry and clearly, you know, there's a there's a, this massive movement to net zero there. So so how do you make sure that it's um, ambitious enough? particularly as an asset manager? Yeah, so I mean, we have the benefit of being a hybrid asset owner, asset manager. And, you know, I, I will say that we've been very deliberate about making uh, net zero commitments as an asset manager. Um, about 35% of our AUM are aligned to net zero today. And most of that is through uh, our, our general account, which is uh, the asset owner side of our business. And only our Nuveen real estate um, group has actually committed to net zero within the asset management side of Nuveen. And why is that? Um, we think that there's already very strong market signals about the demand for net zero carbon buildings in real estate, as well as um, strong client demand for those buildings. So net zero is really aligned with the goals of that business. Um, and it makes sense for it to be our standard offering in real estate. I will say that um, we, I think the jury's still out on, on whether the asset management and uh, banking net zero commitments are really ambitious enough because we have yet to see um, real standards around you know, what percentage of the AUM or the lending is actually going to be aligned to net zero. Is that going to be a significant part of the business of these firms or not? Um, you know, we, I, I think we really would like uh, also commitments around interim target setting to the point of, you know, 2050 is 30 years away. Mm. Uh, we're, we, we ourselves are working toward publishing more information on our interim targets and our pathway um, by the end of this year. And we think that that's really critical to build confidence um, in, among our stakeholders and, and the market in general that, you know, this is not just talk. This is actual transformation of, of how we do business. This is a recognition that climate risk is investment risk. And, you know, we have a, a monumental task ahead of us, and it, it's one that can't happen in a vacuum. It has to happen in concert with um, political actors moving the real economy on a low carbon pathway. Uh, and, and to that end, you know, I, I know we'll talk later about uh, some of the political developments in this space, but, you know, we really see that as a, a absolutely necessary supporting framework to make this all happen. Um, you know, we, we can't get to some of these improvements that Molly just talked about in, in, in various industries by ourselves. And we rely on coalitions of investors with similar objectives, and we rely on government to uh, create a supportive policy environment through things like a carbon tax, things like better um, disclosure requirements for, for finance and other industries. So um, certainly we see this as uh, a collective uh, a collective transformation that we all have to undergo. And, and we're very proud to be on the leading edge of that in the U.S. So I um, really look forward to, you know, putting more meat on the bone in, in, the, in the months and, and years to come. Thanks very much. Um, so, Ronald, um, from your perspective, obviously you have a, a, a wide variety of clients that you're serving. And, you know, how do you 
sort of transition towards net zero while you know ultimately giving the clients the the choice yeah that's yeah, a good question because i think you know you asked the question is it is it enough for asset managers to look at asset owners and the answer is very simple the answer is no it really goes to the heart of the fiduciary duty as an asset manager uh to go beyond that uh, and particularly actually actually is very relevant for the bond market because of course when you look at the equity market and bond markets in, in fixed income, we deal with such a huge array of issuers. So some of them are public companies, but a big chunk of them are private companies, special purpose vehicles, relatively small companies. And of course, you can wait for the, for, for those type of, uh, for, for the clients to make the value assessment, but that value assessment needs to be based on data. And when you look at you know the, uh, the net zero and the, the, the pathways towards that, those are all forward-looking statements. So the, those value statements need to be based on on scientific data, and uh, I think asset owners rightfully look at asset managers to to help them in that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's very much a responsibility of uh, of, of any asset manager to uh, to to help asset owners make that journey. Absolutely. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so um, I'm going to m move on now, um, and, and I think Sarah mentioned. Joel, can I just? Um, can I just? Yeah. Um, I I think we're ducking an issue here. Which okay. Is probably very um, we dived into, and I think we should we should explore, which is this issue of divestment. Um, and let me just, um, I mean, look, completely take on board what what Sarah said in terms of the expectation of financial services groups like us. We, we, you know, we're one of the biggest in in the world, um, and we take our responsibilities and all of this very seriously. So, you know, last year we achieved operational carbon neutrality, and we have committed to doing so every year going forward. Um, we have uh, just actually in the last couple of months committed to financing or facilitating the finance uh, financing of up to two and a half trillion dollars to deliver against the UN sustainability goals. We totally take on board what has been said about the need um, not only just to come out with your net zero commitment, but give a roadmap and illustrate how you're going to do that. And we're using carbon uh, intensity as a measure that we will work with clients in the heaviest carbon emitting parts of our financing portfolio and to work with those clients starting off with electric power, automotive, oil and gas to reduce um, uh, emissions uh, uh, with a 2030 intermediate target. But just on this issue of divestment and, and if you like just dumping any client who's involved in fossil fuels, um, the, 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 the long and the short of it is that at the moment we do not have renewables at scale to be able to meet our energy needs. Um, I get the argument that's made in relation to coal and, you know, we've made a commitment to um, reduce um, the financing that we provided in that sector and committed to phase out our remaining credit exposure to, to, to the major coal companies by 2024. But the long and the short of it is what we need, and this is where I think the role of the sector is absolutely fundamental, is sufficient investment into the renewable technologies and, frankly, some of the technologies that, that don't exist yet, which will enable us to meet the goals of Paris. Now, I think um, in order to reach the goals of Paris, you know, at least a quarter to a third of the contribution to emissions reduction is to come from technologies that haven't been invested yet, um, in, in, you know, haven't been discovered, sorry, invented yet. So I think we've got to be realistic about this because if we did, for example, just divest and shut down all of our fossil fuel industries, well, the long and the short of it is we'd end up with blackouts. Now, if you're a middle-class person who's been able to install all these expensive technologies and you're fairly, fairly well off, then you'll be okay. But uh, if you're one of my many former constituents in, you know, one of the most deprived local authority areas in this country, then you're likely to get the hard effects of that. And you're certainly not going to end up with a just transition. So I just chuck that in there because I don't think we should deduct that big issue. And I'm quite happy for people to shoot me down and disagree with me on that. Um, but I mean, what we found particularly challenging, I suppose, just given our scale, is that we really are at the intersection of some of these hard societal issues and choices around the climate transition um, and we don't duck them we, we we you know we very much sort of confront them and be honest with people about the, the challenges posed here 
Thanks very much, Chaka. Um, I think we I'm going to highlight the fact that we've got 13 minutes left and this is, you know, we're having such a good discussion that and clearly 45 minutes uh, isn't really adequate for it. Um, but but I'm going to move on uh, and just want to talk about um, capital markets, uh, green bonds and sustainability linked bonds. And um, I'm going to turn to Heike um, because her involvement there has been has been extensive. And just ask, um, you know, to, to sketch out the future of a green finance for us, and particularly with the awareness that this new product, sustainability link bonds, has been having such an impact. Um, thanks for that, John. So we've uh, spent a lot of time talking about the E. Um, I was hoping that we would get to talking about the S, but uh, let me talk about labeled bonds for a bit. The labeled bonds are one percent of the total bond market and they have made such an impact and catalyzed this change that we've been talking about in the change of um, investor behaviors, issuer behaviors, and new products are bringing even more transparency and even more focus on the need to um, have good KPIs. But what I think the future of, of, of this you know, sustainable finance is really going to be in focusing on the 99% and finding ways to analyze that. It's not that only the 1% is sustainable finance. Um, Sarah was talking about integrating ESG in the entire portfolio, and that's where we need to move towards. And everything that uh, focuses on transparency, on um, helping investors analyze risks that are maybe just below the surface, and that sort of gets to the S that the pandemic has really um, uh, uh, brought to the surface, I think, or um, you know, just made people realize that uh, sustainable finance isn't just looking at uh, climate, it's also looking at as social risks. And you know, we've seen what happens when you don't when you don't, you know, consider social inequalities um, and um, especially like healthcare enough. Um, so I think that sustainable finance and the bond market, all the, the labels have really or play an incredibly important role. Um, in helping to catalyze a more holistic view, uh, which is one of the reasons why the uh, World Bank is, um, we're labeling all our bonds as sustainable development bonds um, uh, and, and you know, bringing transparency to everything that we're doing and focusing on impact. Thank you. Um, now, Fritz, you're uh, sort of uh, at the coal face, uh, to use an ironic term, of, of dealing with companies of all kinds that are sort of embarking on this transition. And, and thinking about their capital markets interaction. Um, so wh wh what do you think uh, is going to be the role of sort of specialized uh, finance such as green or sustainability linked bonds and versus what Heike is also emphasizing, which is, you know, presenting the overall ESG credentials of an issuer? Um, I mean, we have the, the various different layers of analysis. So you have investors that look at the issuer, you have investors that look at the issue, uh, you have investors that look at both. So it will be always important to ensure that you do enough, uh, that you that you uh, give enough transparency to the market, um, not just on the on the um, uh, uh, on the level of the issue, but also on the level of the issuer. Uh, that's what we're seeing. Um, we. Uh, that's what we are supporting. So what we do, so when we when we think of users proceeds and sustainability link, those are two avenues to this market that is that are open to issuers and they are appropriate in various circumstances, right? So for one issuer and for one uh, for one um, uh, financing project, it is it's very appropriate and and best to use a user proceeds type of model and the next one, can do a sustainability link. And it's nice to see that, uh, you know, the acceptance by the ECB of, of also buying sustainability link trades um, has spurred that mar market also on the bond side, on the corporate bond side, more into gear. Uh, and that's certainly going to help because um, that, and that relates to the previous discussion, uh, all that strive for net zero uh, shouldn't, shouldn't prevent people from being able to transition. And that's really uh, that's and that's that's where we win. We win in the transitioning. We don't win in the green projects that we're already doing. Uh, so um, so I think that's that's an important element. And finally, um, uh, the 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 uh, Forum Nachhaltige Geldanlage, FNG in Germany, has done a survey of 
how how do sustainable how does sustainable investment happen and they found that 93 percent of sustainable investment in germany is done through exclusion criteria and the most prominent exclusion criteria is not an environmental one it's human rights violations and corruption so uh, so the the social element is extremely important and is, is something that issuers uh, need to emphasize as well and that's especially important on the level of the issuer now uh, Heike you touched on uh, the social side of ESG a, a moment ago and I mean the, uh, Shuka also mentioned that uh, you know COVID-19 has had an impact it's certainly widely said that the the pandemic has raised the attention being given to S the S of ESG uh, which had previously been overlooked. So I just want to ask, uh, you know, first of all, Heike, do you think that it genuinely has risen in prominence or is this just something we're saying to sort of make ourselves feel better? I think it genuinely has. I think that uh, investors see very clearly that uh, if they don't focus on S and it's not just the typical things that um, people would think about when they considered S in ESG, which is um, how many women are on the board or how many women are in senior management positions, which is super important. And we have a panel on that later um, on the whole topic of diversity and inclusion. But social risks that come from anything that um, uh, is part of the systems that, um, that we rely on. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about food systems, um, you know, the, the S or the pandemic also uncovered vulnerabilities in education systems. And um, like I said, just what happens um, to societies when there's not enough focus on um, social inclusion and equality. So I think that um, uh, it's, it, it has just, it has raised the S um, in awareness um, and uh, you know, uncovered risks and the, fo the, the need to focus also on uh, opportunities in that areas and not just places that we would think of um, before for the S. Um, now, Sarah, you, I'm sure, have paid attention to social issues all along. So how do you feel when people say, well, you know, the, the, the pandemic or the Black Lives Matter movement has raised the attention to them? Do you, do you feel as a firm you've had to sort of dig deeper and make an extra effort? No, I, I, we have definitely focused on social issues for a long time. Um, the impact framework we use for our impact investing strategies have always had social themes and environmental themes um, going back to 2007. So we're not new to this game. Uh, we've always been investing in affordable housing and community and economic development. Um, I will say that when it comes to how social issues are analyzed in the investment process, we still see um, much more of a qualitative approach needed compared to E and even compared to G, um, because you're not going to have a lot of uh, you know, quantitative data to, to try and understand the level of exposure that you have to these risks. It's, it's very difficult to get a company to report you know, how many instances of um, you know, human <laughs> modern slavery are in their supply chain. Like th those things are just not reported in the same way that carbon emissions or water use are, are reported for obvious reasons. So, you know, I, I think we have a challenge in the sort of the way that we analyze these issues, but I will say that we are hearing a lot more emphasis on social, especially diversity issues um, at the operational level. So every RFP that we get is now asking us, you know, how many, what's the diversity in your, in your workforce? How many portfolio managers are female? How many are minorities? Um, and that's a real change from even just one or two years ago. And I think we can really chalk that up to some of the developments in 2020. So, you know, this is kind of coming at us from a lot of different angles, but certainly we, we, we want to see more, more rigor over time um, to bring the way we think about S issues more in line with the way that we're thinking about E. Thanks very much. Now, we, we're very, very short of time now, so I'm going to ask you all to keep your answers very brief from now on. But, but uh, Ronald, I, I just want to hear your view on that on that same question. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, I think to a degree, actually, the pandemic has really uh, shown the value of looking at S because I think for a lot of investors, the proof is in the pudding. 
So if you look at the pandemic, of course, it was a symmetrical shock, pretty much globally. And you can see, clearly see a, uh, a discernible impact in terms of how different companies uh, performed. So those ones that performed with a very much a shareholder focus versus those ones that have a much more of an inclusive stakeholder approach. And the latter group has just performed much better. So in, in financial markets and also uh, operationally from a non-financial objective. So I think that episode has really drilled the point home, I think, for investors. That S is usually hugely important. You can clearly see it in the financial market performance and as well in the non-financial market performance. Okay, thank you. Um, Joko, um, do you think, are we really building back better? The jury's out on that. Um, I think it's far too early to say. Um, but what are the positives? The positives are that a kind of extreme austerity mindset is being junked in favor of a consensus behind long-term investment and without the long-term investments, particularly in skills and R&D. And when I say skills, often we think of young people. I think we need to completely overhaul our skill systems in some of the developed economies in particular around serving the needs of people in their 40s, 50s, 50s and 60s in particular, who are being put out of work because of the changing nature of the workforce, but are saddled with a set of skills which uh, are, are relevant to a previous time, um, but it's too early for them to retire. So I think if we make those investments, and it's got to be a partnership between the public and private sector, then we can build back better, better and in a more inclusive and equal way. Um, but we're just coming out of this pandemic right now, hopefully. Um, so I think it's too early to start saying that there's great success that we've had on that here or anywhere else. Thank you. Now, Molly, um, we, we're shoehorning this into a ridiculously short time, but you're an expert on the taxonomy, right? Now, we're talking about the social issues. And I want to ask you, Europe's built this green taxonomy. Should there be a social taxonomy? And would that would that be helpful in the, in the very short time we've got left? Absolutely. I think that's in the plan. I very much agree with what Sarah said, that it's much more difficult to measure social impacts. And I think part of this has to be achieved through creative stranding assets. For example, when the conflict minerals regulation came in, people who are dealing in, in certain metals that come from uh, conflict zones in the world, that those assets have lost value. So I think we can address some of this through uh, non-financial reporting and some of it through actually banning certain um, elements from our economy but but absolutely and I explained earlier how, how social and environmental can interact through land displacement through people buying up other people's habitats to offset their emissions and so we need to be absolutely sure that we're progressing these two together because we don't want the people of the world to loss up to lose out because the financiers are looking for environmentally sound investments okay thank you very much we're going to have to leave it there uh, I hope the audience agree with me that this has been a tremendous panel, uh, absolutely rich and thick with ideas, uh, each of which we could have talked about for, for a very long time. Um, so thank you all very much for joining me, the, the panel, and um, you know sharing your expertise with us. And, and thank you too to the audience for, for your questions. Uh, I'm afraid we, we haven't managed to uh, answer all of them. Um, but I would like to also ask you to stay with us. We've got an, uh, another very interesting session coming next, which is Lindsay Schaefer. Uh, she's from the Centre for Climate Aligned Finance and will be giving a keynote presentation. Um, and uh, uh, Euromoney will be back with another uh, event totally on sustainable finance, uh, our regular forum in September 7th to the 8th this year. Um, so thank you so much to the panel um, and to the audience. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.